Good morning, church. Happy Easter Sunday. What a privilege it is to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ, especially in this time of um, fear, especially the fear of death. We are reminded that death and disease no longer have power over us because Jesus Christ has conquered them once and for all so that we could live in victory with him. Let me read from Romans 6, 8 to 11. Now, if we are dead with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once and for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you must also consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Join me in singing this first song, Because He Lives. I believe in the sun. I believe in the risen one. I believe I By the power of His blood, Amen. praise to Jesus, our Lord and King. He arose from the grave, able and mighty to save. Let's sing the song, church.
Jesus for dying on the cross so that we can be saved. Thank you for arising from the grave, conquering death, sin once and for all. We praise you and we thank you, Lord Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Worthy of every song you could ever sing. Worthy of every praise you could ever receive. Worthy of every breath you could ever be. We live for you. Jesus, the name of God, the other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever save. Worthy of every breath we could ever do, we live for you. Oh, we live for you. Holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. Sing it again. For He is worthy. Worthy of all 
the pills, forget about them. Worthy of every breath, we get up our feet. We live for you. Oh, we live for you. Jesus, the name of our Jesus, the only one who did it for sin. Worthy of every breath, we did it for thee. We live for you. Oh, we live for you. And holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and leave in your love to those around me. Holy, there is no one like you, there is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and me in your love to those around me. And I will build my life upon your love. It is the firm foundation. And I will put my trust in you alone. And I will not be shaken. I will build my life upon your love. It is the firm foundation, and I will put my trust in you alone. And I will not be shaken. Beside you, open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. Holy, there is no one like you, there is none beside you open up my eyes and wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and me in your love to those around me and I will build my life upon your love it is the firm foundation and i will put my trust in you alone and i will not be shaken all my life for you lord all my days for you
firm foundation that we can count on as we face our future, and all because you live and you are our Savior. In Jesus' name we pray. Magandang umaga po, GCF Makati. I invite you all for our community prayer. Let us bow our heads in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we thank you once again for giving us the favor that as a church family, we can still join our hearts together in spirit to worship, to pray and to listen to your very words, even if we are physically away from each other. With the many uncertainties, worries, and fears that COVID-19 creates worldwide, we can still be grateful because as your word says, God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to His purpose for them. In your divine wisdom, while we are in the midst of pandemic crisis, you appointed this day as the day of commemorating the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for that, Father. May you shape the focus of our minds from crisis to Christ is, that indeed He is the resurrection and the life, that His resurrection is the all-important event in the history of the world, not COVID-19. We pray, Father, that as your church, we remain whole in body, mind, and spirit, and we continually grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It is Jesus whom we need. He existed before anything else, and He holds all creation together. We pray, Father, that Your name be kept holy, that Your kingdom come soon, and that Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. As we seek first your kingdom and your righteousness, we pray that we take the opportunity to reflect and mirror your righteousness by doing and thinking what is right, what is good to everyone, to those in our communities, families, government, circle of friends, and especially to those in the family of faith who are in serious need of basic necessities. Give us today the food we need. We pray for wisdom to those of us who are employed that we can contribute to the companies we work for in whatever way or small way to lessen the burden that they are currently handling. For those of us who are in the end of our ropes with no more financial resources coming in, with loved ones in critical conditions and with loved ones already gone, may your grace, Father, be very evident during these times that you who hold us in Christ will yourself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish us. As Christians, we are still capable of doing conceivable sins, such as sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, murder, idolatry, quarreling, selfish ambition, slander, robbery, division, envy, and other sins like this. We pray, Father, that you forgive us our sins, as we have forgiven those who sin against us. And don't let us shield to temptation, but rescue us from the evil one. Help us to remember, Father, that we belong to Christ Jesus, who have nailed the passions and desires of our sinful nature to his cross and crucify them there. Let us follow, Father, the abiding spirits leading in every part of our lives. And lastly, we pray for our Pastor Olibik that you continually sustain him as he lovingly obey you in preaching your very word, that you bless him, enlarge his borders, that your hand would be with him, and that you would keep him from evil. We pray all these things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen and Amen.
Good morning, church. I am so glad that we are still able to gather, especially this Sunday as we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I hope we had all been able to take some time to meditate on the seven last words of Jesus, and I pray that we learn how to fix our eyes on Him and allow Him to transform us, especially during these circumstances that we're in. Now, for this Sunday, our scripture reading will be taken from the book of the Revelation of Jesus, chapter 2, verses 1 to 5. So, if you have your Bibles with you, please turn to Revelation, chapter 2, verses 1 to 5. To the church in Ephesus. To the angel of the church in Ephesus, write, the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and have found them to be false. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary. But I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. Repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Oh, <laughs> 
Good morning. Happy Resurrection Sunday, everyone. How I wish that we are together right now celebrating this beautiful day that the Lord had given us. But regardless, even though we are apart right now, we are scattered, each and everyone into their own homes. We are gathered in the presence of the Lord. So in behalf of Barks and myself and Pam at the back of the camera, we want to wish every one of you a happy Resurrection Sunday. Indeed, the Lord lives. He is risen, He is not dead. The Lord lives, His love lives, He reigns supreme. And we are assured and we, are, we have confidence that our life is secured in His hands because of His love for you and for me. And so we are going to get to the Word. And before we do just that, let us join our hearts in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank You for the truth that You are alive. Thank You, Lord, because You are not dead. The grave is empty, the tomb is empty, and you are here with us right here, right now. Wherever we are right now, you are present there. And Lord, I pray that as we contemplate your resurrection, Lord, that you would fill us with your love. Not only that we would know that we are loved by you, that, but we would experience your love right now. Lord, fill us so with your love that we in turn would love you back and strive to love one another as you have loved us. Father, we submit to you our affections, our minds, and our wills. Take them captive. Holy Spirit, have your way in us. You are the pastor and the leader of our church. We look to you, Lord, for guidance. Would you point us to Jesus that we might glorify him as we study the Bible? Thank you, Lord, for your grace to us. We commit to you this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The sermon title for the message we have today is Love Lives, Experiencing Intimacy with Christ. Love lives, and now we can experience intimacy with Christ. I have three points right now, and these are the points. Love lives. The second point is love lives. And the third point is love lives. So these are the three points. Love lives. Love lives, and love lives. Let's get to those three points, one at a time. The song that we just heard a while ago, and before we, we continue on, a big a big thank you to uh, Anne and uh, Tita Eileen uh, Kura for that wonderful special number that you have, uh, have uh, graced us with. A big thank you also to Zara uh, for leading the scripture. Uh, and um, Kuya Joel for that prayer and also Yen for that beautiful uh, uh, worship and song. Now this, the special number that we have heard a while ago says, Down the Via Dolorosa, called the way of suffering, like a lamb came the Messiah Christ the King, but he chose to walk that road out of his love for you and for me down the Via Dolorosa, all the way to Calvary. This past week, I had the privilege of looking at uh, Jesus' passion in the crucifixion. And I have the privilege of studying the, uh, the final seven words that Jesus spoke on the cross. And, and in studying these words, I come to realize the agony of what Jesus had gone through uh, when he walked via Dolorosa, the road to Calvary. He was tried unjustly. He was beaten within an inch of his life. He was flogged. He was mocked. He was spat on. He was, he was forsaken by the Father. 
he was nailed to a cross spikes were hammered into his wrists and in his feet he was suspended and he was grasping for air he was in tremendous physical suffering that he was so dehydrated that he said i thirst and yet nothing would fail pale into comparison when we think about what he endured in the hands of god when he took your sins and mine that he cried out from the cross my god my god why have you forsaken me and yet he says to us it is finished that the wrath of god has been poured out totally on him that there is no more wrath for you and i if we put our trust and confidence in jesus christ as our savior and lord the song says that he walked that road out of his love for you and for me isn't that what jesus says in john chapter 10 that greater love has no man than this that someone would lay down his life for his friends nobody took jesus's life away from him he laid it down of his own accord out of his love for you and for me but the glory of resurrection sunday is that this god who had loved us is not dead that his love continues on god is alive he is not dead the god who loves us lives one of the most tender moments uh, during the crucifixion account is found in john chapter 19 verses 26 and 27 it says this when jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby he said to his mother woman behold your son then he said to the disciple behold your mother and from that hour the disciple took her to his own home john the writer of the book of revelation was there present at the crucifixion of jesus he referred to himself as the disciple whom jesus loved have you ever felt uh, the loss of somebody you loved have you ever grieved over a person who had passed away that is dear to you or maybe a relationship that is broken could you imagine what john and mary the mother of jesus would have felt at the foot of the cross as they're contemplating this person whom they have loved and who have loved them in turn agonizing in death oh i believe that they were so moved in their inward person are you a person who loves jesus when you look at the cross what do you feel john stott says this in his book the cross of christ god could quite justly have abandoned us to our faith he could have left us alone to reap the fruit of our wrongdoing and to perish in our sins it is what we deserved but he did not because he loved us he came after us in christ he pursued us even to the desolate anguish of the cross where he bore our sins guilt judgment and death it takes a hard and stony heart to remain unmoved by a love like that when you look at the cross of jesus christ where he suffered and died for the forgiveness of your sins of mine are you moved by it is your heart stirred up do you feel love for jesus I want to ask you this question today my friends does the love of jesus move you does his love still find resonance in your heart does jesus's love still moves you friends i want you to know that jesus's love lives that when john and mary looked up on the cross and they were agonizing in their hearts as they saw this person that they had loved die a cruel death my friends i want you to know that that same john is the author of the book of revelation that when he is an old man he was still communing with jesus the god who loved him love lives the christ who loved you on the cross is alive today the, the Christ who loved you on the cross lives today. He is not dead. He is alive. 
So this love that we commune with Him, that we experience with Him, this love will never end. In fact, Paul says, nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Jesus Christ is not dead. He is alive. Notice the first verse of the, of the passage that Zara read for us this morning. Jesus says to the angel of the church in Ephesus write, The words of him who holds the seven stars in, the right, in his right hands, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. So if you look at this verse, you would see Jesus really alive. He has words. He holds the stars in his right hand. He walks among the golden lampstands. Jesus is alive. Now I know that there are many a symbolism in that statement alone. And I wish I had time to unpack that for you. But let me give you this comment from Henry Barclay Sweet in his commentary in the Apocalypse of St. John. This is what he says. The Lord patrols the ground and is ever on the spot when He is needed. He is alive. He is surveying the world. He is everywhere. He is in us. He is with us. Though we are apart, He is with us. And the Lord is ever on the spot when He is needed. He is never far away from you and from me. I want you to know that. And as John is writing uh, the book of Revelation and addressing it to the seven churches, and one of them is the church in Ephesus, he wants them to know that this Jesus is alive and he is active. And he is out and he is surveying the whole world. He is not dead. He is almighty. He is powerful. And he is there when he is needed. Notice again what Revelation chapter 2, verse 2 and 3 says. Jesus says, I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and found them to be false. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary. Wow, what a great church this church in Ephesus was. You know, the church in Ephesus is a church that probably if it existed during our time, that we would like to be part of this church. You know, the church of Ephesus is, is a church that, were, that was pastored by a who's who of Bible characters. You would remember that Paul wrote an epistle to the church in Ephesus. We know it as, a book, as the epistle uh, to the Ephesians. Paul pastored this church. John, I don't know if you are aware of this, but the Gospel of John and the three epistles of John, and now we find the book of Revelation was written primarily to be read in the church in Ephesus. And there are people there who had pastored that church and had been taught in that church, Priscilla and Aquila. We know that they were part of this church. It is a who's who of of strong Bible leaders that laid the foundation of good doctrine and good practice for this church. And Jesus says, the risen Christ says, I know your works. Now, no ordinary kind of work because Jesus says, I know your toil and your patient endurance. What is he talking about here? It's no ordinary kind of work. The commentary says this is a kind of work that would lead to weariness. He knows how they patiently endure for the work of the gospel. Jesus continues on to say that this church cannot bear with those who are evil. They have a high standard for morality. They strive to keep themselves pure. And so they have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not. They, they have an acumen for right teaching. They are not easily swayed. Jesus says, I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary. And so to speak, this church is going through tremendous suffering for the name of Christ, but they are patiently enduring for Jesus' name's sake, and they are not growing weary. What a wonderful church. When I think about the church in Ephesus, I can't help but also to think about our church in GCF Makati. Now, I, I, I'm not saying that we're anywhere close to the church of Ephesus in what they have accomplished for the Lord. But I am, I am gladdened uh, to see our growth 
and how even through this dispersion, this scattering that we are experiencing right now, I, I'm so glad to hear reports that you are still worshiping the Lord, that you are advancing the gospel. Thank you for the updates that you have sent me, that you have used these devotions that we have put out to share the gospel to the people who are around you. I praise the Lord for giving you endurance, even in this time of crises and suffering, that we have really strived in labored together to advance the agenda of our Lord. The Bible says the Lord knows our toil. The Lord is so concerned about what we are going through in our lives. He knows and His knowledge is not just mere head knowledge like a supervisor having a list and having a checklist and saying, okay, GCF Makati did that. Okay, the Church of Ephesus did that. Bible reading, prayer, growth groups. It's not like He has a checklist of, of things that we are doing right or wrong. He is intimately acquainted with what we are going through. As I have studied the seven last words of Jesus, specifically when he talks to John, the disciple whom he loved and entrusts his mother to him, I realize that Jesus is not only concerned about our grave sin problem, Jesus also cares about our daily needs. The words that he spoke on the cross was spoken with tremendous pain but with tremendous love as well. He was there paying the penalty for our sins. He was agonizing as he was enduring the, the, the pain that he was experiencing in his physical body but also spiritually enduring the punishment that is laid on him because of the wrath of God for your sin and mine. But yet on the cross, he was not only concerned about our uh, sin problem and our need for eternal security and help, although that is the most important thing we need. At the cross, he looks at the people he loves and he was concerned about their daily needs. That's why he entrusts his mother Mary to John, the disciple whom he loved. And the disciple whom he loved, he entrusts to his mother Mary to be cared for. Jesus loves us, but not only in a distant kind of love, not only in a general kind of love, but in an intimate kind of love, a well-acquainted kind of love. Jesus is concerned not only about the general things in our lives, though those are the very important things in our lives. He is intricately concerned about the daily needs of our lives. Jesus loves us. Luke 12, 22 to 24, we hear these words from our Lord. He said to his disciples, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat, nor about your body, what you will put on. For life is more than food, and the body more than clothing. Consider the ravens. They neither have storehouses nor barn, and yet God feeds them. Of how much more value are you than the birds? So Jesus is saying, don't be worried. The Lord is concerned about your very physical needs, not only the general stuff, but the things that you need in your everyday life. That's why Peter says in 1 Peter 5, 6, and 7, Humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time He may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on Him because He cares for you. My friends, I want you to know that God's love lives. And this love is very much concerned about us. Not only in a general abstracted way, but in an intimate way. Jesus wants to be with us. Jesus wants to be part of our lives. It is His joy to give up His life for your life to the end that we would be with Him forever. Jesus loves you and me. His love lives. He is alive. He knows what we're going through. He is not superfluous uh, against our suffering. In fact, He suffered in a way that we cannot imagine and suffered in a way that you and I would never suffer so that you and I might be spared and would have the fullness of joy in His presence. Jesus' love lives and nothing can separate us from His love. Now the question I want to explore is, well, does our love live? Question mark. Love lives? How is our intimacy with Christ who lives? 
So if He lives and He loves us in a very intimate way, I wonder how we are living our lives. Does the Lord Jesus Christ love still live in us? So remember all of the good things that, that Jesus spoke of in this Ephesian church. But yet in verse 4, Jesus says, But I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. So despite of all of these good things that they're doing, their works, their toil, their endurance, their, their, their passion for purity and the rightness of doctrine, and, and, and how they have endured and not grown weary. They're a good church, but Jesus had one concern and one problem and one thing against them, and that is that they have abandoned the love that they had at first. The New Living Translation puts it this way. It's very interesting how it, uh, the New Living Translation renders this for us. It says, But I have this complaint against you. You don't love me or each other as you did at first. See, I don't think the problem of the Ephesian church at this moment is that they don't love Jesus at all. I believe if we ask them whether or not they love God, they would say with a straight face, Oh yes, we love Him. That's why we're doing all of these things. No, Jesus Christ is not saying, You don't love me at all. What He's saying is, You don't love me like you did before the intensity of your love for me is not as deep and profound as it was when you were beginning that in the course of all of these good things that you're doing how you're striving and working for me that your love for me that your intimacy with me had grown cold and have shriveled you don't love me or each other as you did at first intimacy intimacy comes from an old latin word that means deep fellowship in the inmost being as i looked at intimacy uh, in, in in the internet today it saddened me that whenever our culture talks about intimacy, all we can think about is a physical gratification or sexual uh, relations. But when the Bible talks about intimacy, it's deep fellowship in the inmost being. One of the blessings that I have received uh, during this quarantine um, season is an extended time with my wife. For the past year, um, one of our one of our struggles is that we got so busy. We got so busy about uh, the medical workups that we're doing. Got so busy about I got busy with church stuff. She was busy about school stuff. And this year, we were praying to the Lord that He would grant us a time of rest. And little did I know that the Lord would answer that prayer by imposing a quarantine that we don't have anywhere to go to but home and at this time one of my 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 utmost joy is is being with her sharing meals with her laughing there's nothing on tv and so we would tell each other stories and we would laugh and we would speak and we just have deep conversations about anything under the sun friends that's what intimacy means now you can you can love we we can absolutely love anything but but to love someone with intimacy means that there is an intensity to that love there is a weight with that love but unfortunately as we go through our lives that intimacy that intensity grows shallower becomes weaker and we find ourselves out of touch Yes, we would say that we love each other, but the weight and the intensity of it has diminished. Jesus looks at this church who had, who had done most of the things well, and He says to them, You know what? I missed how you would love me before. I missed how you loved me when you first met me and when you had first begun. Now notice again what John Stott said in the quote I read for you a while ago. 
He says that it takes a hard and stony heart to remain unmoved by a love like that. A love that, 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 that Jesus manifested on the cross for you and I. You know, when I look at the cross, and, and surely uh, this past week, I, I have labored intently in, in, in studying the word of the Lord and looking at what Jesus had done on the cross for you and for, for me. And if you watch the videos that we had put out, there are many times that I lose my compulsion, composure and, and, and I feel the weight of the Lord's love for me and, and my, my utter unworthiness for that kind of love. And so when I look at the cross, I, I, am mo I am moved by it. But if I'm being honest with you, that's not the case in my everyday life. There are many days that, that, that 24 hours go by where I have not even contemplated on Jesus. On what he had done for me on the cross yes I study scripture yes I do all of these things but the intensity of love was not there you know what it is so easy to be unmoved it is so easy to have a hard heart and stony heart it is as easy as doing nothing have you ever thought how to make a substance lukewarm so imagine if this cup contains hot coffee how do you make this hot coffee lukewarm it's easy as doing nothing if you set it on the table and leave it there it will be lukewarm imagine if this cup was filled with with cold refreshing iced tea how do you make it lukewarm it's as easy as doing nothing you set it there and go about your day Soon enough, it would be lukewarm. And that is how our hearts become cold towards God. When we do nothing, we lose the intensity of the love that we have for Jesus at first. Friends, let me share to you the things that I have found in my life to be intimacy killers. I know that you can name many more, but let me just share to you five that I have found true in my life to be intimacy killers the first one and the prime reason why my intimacy towards god grow cold is harbored sin harbored sin sin that i don't want to let go psalm 66 verse 18 says if i had cherished iniquity in my heart the lord would not have listened see if there is something in my life that that i know that god does not approve of and yet i enjoy i know i can't go to the presence of god and not be confronted with what i i am enjoying and so my tendency is just to neglect the things of god in order to focus my attention to these desires i'm cultivating that is called harbored sin and you know my friends sin whatever kind of sin kills intimacy but specifically harbored sin sin that we are so callous about that we refuse to relinquish into in repentance into the into the hands of god friends that is sure that would kill your intimacy with god you won't notice it but in one way or another your intimacy with god grows cold that's the first one that's true in my heart the second thing that I have noticed that kills my intimacy with God is just stuff. Uh, just stuff. Not just bad stuff. Obviously, Harvard sin is bad stuff. But just stuff in general. Uh, Hebrews 12 verses 1 and 2 verses, verse 1 says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us yes harbored sin kills intimacy but not just harbored sin but every kind of weight now the Ephesians Ephesian church were you know if you look at them it doesn't seem that they're addicted to bad stuff they were doing good stuff but yet those good stuff in the end is are just tough and the question is not whether they're sinning or not the question becomes are they growing in intimacy with god friends i have realized that i as, as a person who who has the calling and has the mandate and the job to study this book they 
have learned the capacity to to open the word of the Lord and just look at it as stuff that when I look at the word of the Lord it's, there are times in my life that my anxieties take over and it is just weakening me and encumbering me that I cannot run well in my life this is stuff any kind of stuff the stuff that you watch the stuff that you you do the stuff that you work on the stuff that you put your affections and your desires to at the end of the day these are all stuff and the question is not whether this is sin or not they might not be sin but sometimes and I have to say most of the time this stuff is causing us not to be able to run well so that's an intimacy killer stuff be mindful of your stuff a third intimacy killer that I found in my own life is a hurried pace. A hurried pace. Now that I am in quarantine, now that we are in quarantine, now that things become slow, I realize what I should be valuing more in my life. When the quarantine hit and suddenly the pace of the world just began to slow down, I, I suddenly realized what I should be really paying attention to. Like the basic stuff of I, I can be so busy that I don't mind the things in our house anymore. I'm so busy to do the laundry. And now that I'm doing the laundry, I realize that, man, I should be doing this stuff. A and my life has become very hurried to the point that I am too busy to be with the Lord as well. And notice Psalm 46 verse 10. This is a familiar psalm, isn't it? Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. Friends, uh, if you look at the psalm, you have to ask the question, how do you begin to know God as your God? How, how do you grow in your understanding of God and intimacy with God? How can you do that unless you are still? Unless you slow down and not be hurried about these urgent things that you think are so important, but at the end of the day, it's not as important as being with your maker. Are you still right now? I, I love how uh, Charles Wendell puts it in one of his sermons at the Dallas Theological Ch uh, Seminary Chapel. chapel. Uh, Chuck Swindoll said, you know, the Lord will not speed up so that you can walk together. You have to slow down. I have realized that it is my tendency to go ahead of God, to be so hurried of God. And there are times that the Lord would remind me, Son, you got to slow down. You got to wait on me. You have to be patient. I am teaching you something. Slow down. Life is not about getting to the end quickly. Life is about going with me. Life is about walking with me. Are you too hurried? For the Lord, friends, that is a sure intimacy killer. Slow down. Wait on the Lord. Be patient. The Lord is teaching you something. The fourth intimacy killer that I have found present even in my own heart are needless pains. Needless pains. Now what are these? Now I, I, I got this concept from a hymn actually that we sing in church. From the hymn, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. You know that line that says, Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. Needless pain is caused by prayerlessness. These are anxieties, uh, the cares of this world that, that like weeds grow up in my heart and suddenly chokes the things of the Lord inside of me. These are needless pains. I, I don't really need to be anxious about this because by prayer or supplication with thanksgiving, I can lift it up to God. But, but I have to be honest that a lot of times I choose to be anxious, though I don't really have to, instead of coming to the Lord in prayer and thanksgiving. And the, and the hymn goes, Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. Just, we don't, just because we don't want to carry everything to God in prayer so that's the fourth one here's the fifth one an intimacy killer for me 
It's being a spiritual foodie. You know what a foodie is? You know, I got this from Francis Chan, and he, he puts it nicely. You know what a foodie is? A, a foodie is, is, is a person who, who, who just have a palate, and he, he goes to restaurants, and he, he could just dissect flavors, and he, he, can, he, he would know what, what wine would go with what cheese, and, and what soup is better. And, and, and this is a person who would give you a lot of restaurant advices, and he, he could point you to, to great menus, and, and great orders, and great selections. And, and this is just a discerning palate for food and and I have found in myself that I can be a spiritual foodie now, what what do I mean by a, a spiritual foodie uh, you know what at this time technology has opened uh, for us a, a great means of communication and information dissemination I can go on the internet and and I I can I can hear sermons from 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 a who's who of Christian leaders and I can listen to music from a who's who of worship leaders and I can sit there and and listen to what they have to say from the word of the Lord and and I go yeah I like that point but this guy said it better and and, and I think his perspective in these things is well better said than this person and I'm a spiritual foodie here I am hearing the words of the Lord with the discerning palate and yet I hear it I critique it and I choose and for myself and yet it leaves no resonance in my life yes I can have a great theology yes I can sing all the wonderful praise and worship music but yet I'm a spiritual foodie I'm just a discerning person and, and I can I, I have this this buffet of things and yet I find it that even though I have all of these options I don't really get to sit and to feast on the word of the Lord like a starving person. You know what Jesus said? He said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness for they would be filled. He did not say, blessed are the spiritual foodies for they shall be filled. This is a hymn that I have discovered in this quarantine season that speaks uh, heavily to my heart. It's by Isaac Watts. It's, it's a hymn called, How Sweet and Awful is the Place. Uh, this is what he says how sweet and awful is the place with christ within the doors while everlasting love displays the choices of her stores while all our hearts and all our songs join to admire the feast each one of us cry with thankful thanks lord why was i a guest why why was i made to hear thy voice and enter while there's room when thousands make a wretched choice and rather starve than come you know that's that's the state of a spiritual foodie you know a person who really hungers from the lord it, he, when he tastes and see that the lord is good he just gorges in it he gluts in it and he he indulges in it with an open heart with a thankful mind and he just feasts on the word of the lord there are spiritual foodies that go yeah i like this i like that but does not end up feasting on the things of the lord that is a sure intimacy killer being a spiritual foodie I don't want to be a spiritual foodie anymore so so love lives in the sense that Jesus Christ lives and his love is alive He does not love us in a general way but in a very particular way the question is about our love question mark do we love him with intensity and with intimacy how is your intimacy uh, with God because love should live it, it should it, our love for God should endure our love for God should should grow in intensity over time like the hymn goes the longer I serve him the sweeter he grows it, it doesn't have to diminish thus our love endure hear the admonition of the Lord in revelations revelation 2 verse 5 Jesus says remember therefore from where you have fallen repent and do the works you did at first if not I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent he, he continues on to say yet this you have you hate the work of the Nicolaitans which I also hate and in verse 7 he says he who has an ear let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches 
To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life which is in the paradise of God. Jesus admonishes the church, remember from where you have fallen, repent. Robert Mount says in his commentary in the book of Revelations, this is how he puts that verse. Bear in mind the loving relationship you once enjoyed and make a clean break with your present manner of life. How good is that word? Bear in mind the loving relationships you once enjoyed and make a clean break with your present manner of life. When I read this, I can't help but, but to think as, as if, you know, I had this relationship with Jesus uh, in colloquial terms, right? Jesus Christ, mag-on kami ni Jesus dati. Kami, kami dati. We were together, Right? But in the course of my life, I found other loves that I left him behind and got into relationship with other loves. You see this picture? Mounts is saying, get a clean break from that love that you have right now. Look back to the kind of love that you had with Jesus. Make a clean break. Divorce that love. Go back to Jesus. And change your present manner of life. Here we are, when we first started our walk with the Lord, we were so in love with Jesus. But then as we grew older, and as we put years under the badge of our walk with the Lord, we find that we have fallen in love with other things. And again, these can be any stuff. Aspirations, dreams, even ministry, even sin. And we gradually... Let go of the hand of Jesus in order to cling to the hands of the world, of the devil, and of our flesh, even unknowingly. We have to make a clean break, sever our relationship with that, and get back to Jesus. Our love should endure. Listen to what Paul says, Philippians 3 verse 8 to 10 indeed i count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing christ jesus my lord for his sake i have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that i may gain christ and be found in him not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law but that which comes through faith in christ the righteousness from god that depends on faith that i may know him in the power of his resurrection and may share in his sufferings becoming like him in his death that by any means possible i may attain the resurrection from the dead i like this in the amplified version look at verse 10 in the amplified version philippians 3 10 in the amplified version says this for my determined purpose that i may know him that i may progressively become deeply and intimately acquainted with him perceiving and recognizing and understanding the wonders of his person more strongly and more clearly and that I may in that same way come to know the power outflowing from his resurrection. How bad do you want to get to know Christ? Paul says that he wants to know Christ deeply and intimately and to be acquainted with him in this way. How bad do you want to get to know Christ? And this, if we would take it seriously, this is a journey of intensity in intimacy. Friends, this season that we are in, as this virus has spread, is an eye-opener for us to really think about what we prioritize as the people of God. This is a call for us to think and to rethink and to retool about how we do our ministries. Now we're doing ministries just for the sake of being called a good church or, or, or a well put together church with all of these fancy ministries going on or, or are we actually growing deeper and deeper in love with Jesus? See at the end of the day we can be doing everything right by, by church standards and yet when the Lord looks at us, He is frustrated because despite of all of these things that we are doing well, our love for Him is not as intense anymore. 
Friends, this is a call for us to get intently in touch with Jesus, that our love for Him would grow deeper and deeper in intimacy as we grow old. Friends, this is a time that we really prioritize our intimacy with God. See, the expression that comes naturally when you are in love with Christ. This week, I, I, I understood what that meant. I was, I was telling my wife, there are many times that I would say, you know, this is the hardest preaching I've ever done. This is the hardest study that I've ever done. This week is no different. You know what? Every single day since Monday this week, my routine has been, I wake up early in the morning, I study the word of the Lord, write a fresh sermon, put together a, a slide presentation, record it, edit it, upload it, and then I return again the following morning, study the word of the Lord, write a fresh sermon, preach it, upload it. And this has been my repeated pattern and, and at a certain point it, it, it felt very heavy. It became very tedious. You, knew, you know what kept me going? What kept me going is that as I read the word of the Lord and as I contemplated what Jesus Christ had done for me, my heart is stirred by the love that He had given me, that my heart is called to love Him back in return. And then I would think about you. And I would think about how concerned I am that you would grow in love with Jesus. And you know what? As I began to do that, I am a person who's camera shy. I am a person who knows nothing about video editing. Those things came naturally because I am a person who is in love. I am in love with Jesus. And I love you guys. My prayer, my prayer is that you would also join me in this pursuit. That you would actually read, read the words that are coming out from this book and you would allow these words to come deeply into your soul and that you would love Jesus with a furious intensity. Because if you do, the expression of it becomes natural. And though you get tired physically, your spirit is renewed with the love of Jesus. And like the song goes, the longer I serve and the sweeter it grows. Friends, Jesus is alive. God's love lives. And so we have to ask ourselves, do we love Him in return? And challenge ourselves, love Him enduringly, persevering in love, committing our lives to Him as He had committed His life into the hands of God so that you and I would have fellowship with Him. Happy Resurrection Day, everybody. We have gone through many resurrection days in our Christian life, but I pray that this one would be meaningful, that this one would be different, that as a result of having encountered the Lord, that we would draw closer to Him, that we would be so madly in love with Him, with a deep intensity, that the expression of it, loving others, become natural to us. I thank the Lord for the opportunity to share with you His Word. And I pray that this strikes through in your heart. Let's join our hearts in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you because you loved us so profoundly. Thank you, Lord, for the love that you expressed to us on the cross of Calvary. You held nothing back. You love us not only in a general way, but in a very special way, in a very intimate way. You are so acquainted with our lives and our concerns that you have numbered our head. You said that we are, we are more of great value than, than many sparrows, Lord, and you care about us. Thank you for loving us in that way. And Lord, in light of your love, we begin to look at our love and I pray that you would challenge our love to grow deeper and become more intense for your glory and honor. Help us not grow stale, but Lord, by the mercy of the Holy Spirit, lead us deeper and deeper in depth and in knowledge of you. It's the least we can do in light of your love for us. Thank you, Lord, because you are not dead and you're alive. And the good work that you have started in us, you are able to bring that into completion at the day of Christ Jesus. We praise you, Lord, and we glorify you. And now, may the God who loves us, the God who had spared nothing but gave everything for us, 
may He receive all of the glory, dominion, power, and authority in our lives, in our church, as we are scattered and yet gathered together in His presence. May He receive all the glory, power, and authority in our church at this time and forevermore. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you all.